meeting, a regular meeting of the Rest of the School Board. It is Monday, the 28th of January, um, 5.30 p.m. We are in the forum room of the Rest of the School. First, uh, we'll have a roll call. Chris Greenland? Here. Valerie Howe? Here. Joyce Iverson? John Linder? Here. Jeff Michael? Here. Bonnie Pinson? Here. Kathy Wade? Here. Abby Hay? Okay, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I thank you. We're going to have item four adoption of the agenda. Uh, yes, I'll be issuing a statement of retraction at the end of the board meeting prior to the informational meeting. That my comment uh, on uh, the last board meeting in reference to the grant, the DNR grant, and the sidewalk has caused some concern with our city fathers. So I will issue a statement of retraction here. I would like to add my agenda. Okay. Okay. Uh, Yes. Do we have any 
thoughts at this point? I think Lauren sent out an email. Uh, she sent an email about um, her about wanting to know how we wanted to handle asking the questions. Do we need to sign in advance? Um, and I would just throw out that I've been involved in the process, although it's been 20 years, but we did this um, where we, we started asking the questions. And it wasn't really like a big deal in advance. Some of these volunteers would start, said, okay, I'll take one and start reading. And then I think we just go around. I don't think there's any need to assign them. First question you ask might be a chance for you to just you know, introduce yourself to the applicant and the question. Maybe I'll introduce ourselves to start with here. Yeah. Just as we, we moved into the new building, we kind of changed our schedule here a little bit. Went from having obviously six, six, seventh and eighth grade at Fulmer and Peterson and the high school in Rushford. And at the time when we, we did some, we formed the committee, did some research on the schedule, and then decided to go with the new schedule. We got board approval in October of 2016. And just kind of thought one of those things of, not many of you guys were board members in October of 2016. So just given an opportunity to explain our schedule, where it was, how we came to what we are, got some staff feedback. I know that was a question last year, the last year being the first year of trimester, so we could get some staff feedback on it. What does the staff think about it? And there's just some concerns overall with it. So just an opportunity to give you guys the history of it, also kind of where we're at, and show you some of the feedback from the staff. So to start, before we move to the new building, so the middle school, on their own, they've had teachers had six periods of 30 <coughs> minutes and then a 30 minute study hall. So teachers had to teach 280 minutes. What a teacher taught in the middle school is they taught five classes, had a 50 minute prep, had a 30 minute study hall, that was their 280 minutes, and they were done at the middle school at 250 each day, which allowed for that time for them to come over here to the high school and back to Russia with the kids that rode the bus. 
the high school was on a modified block schedule. I'm not sure how long they were on that. When I started in the fall of 13, that's what we were on here. Three periods of 78 minutes where kids changed at the semester. And two periods of 44 minutes. That was a skinny, they called it. They had the same class all year long. And then they had a study hall at the end of the day. And that study hall varied from 20 minutes, which it is now, to about 40 minutes. And kind of the reason for that, I'll explain a little bit. But that's kind of where we were when we started. In addition, we had some elective teachers that had to be shared. So we had art teacher, egg teacher, some of our choir teacher, Spanish teacher, a lot of those electives, tech ed teacher, had to travel between Peterson and Rushford. So the, the different schedules kind of worked. It left for some travel time, but that was tough. And then up until the 2016-17 school year, a student could not take both band and choir. And the reason how that was set up when I came here, during those skinnies, those all year 44, they were second and third hour in that schedule. Second hour was band, third hour was choir. But then during those, they had built in their freshman science classes, their junior math classes were built right into those. So then as a freshman science kid, you took science either second or third, it was, it was almost impossible for some kids to get into both band and choir. I'll talk about some changes we made and the concerns that was with that, but that was one of the things too. So, once the new building got approved, first thought was, I need to form a committee of any middle school, high school staff that's interested to discuss schedule options. Because we want to be as close as the same as possible. I'd like to be on the same exact schedule. Doesn't always work for middle school, high school. But as close as possible, so if we have those sharing of staff like we talked about, we don't have that dead time, that lag time, where a teacher doesn't quite fit. And I'll talk about some of the restrictions coming up doesn't quite fit, they have like 20 minutes so they have nothing to do where it just doesn't quite fit in and it doesn't count and they're not full and kind of goes all over the place. So how can we be as close to the same as possible? So I invited any middle school, high school teacher that wanted to be part of it. So I know there's some teachers that are very against the trimesters and have said, I had no say in it. They were invited to be part of it. We started meeting in January. We met six times starting in January and we discussed the current schedules. Research and compared schedules of approximately 40 to 50 schools of similar size in the state. How I did that was simply went on the state high school league website, sports, Minnesota State High School League website, looked at enrollments, started at Rush with Peterson, went 20 to 25 up, 20 to 25 down, went to their websites, pulled off their schedules, and put together a big matrix of what other people in the state are doing because I don't think there's a perfect schedule out there because everyone's doing something different. If there was, everyone would follow that. So I just said, hey, what are they doing? Because I know what I came from before I came here. The modified block, some teachers, that's all they knew here. So how can we give that info out? Committee members, after each meeting, they discussed, they brought back to their learning communities with their teachers. We've got two in the high school, one in the middle school and gave kind of feedback. So that was our goal between so we didn't have to have six meetings of 30, 35 staff members and me. So you get that smaller group that really wants to take some time in it to go through that. Some of the discussion points, the almost the non-negotiables we talked about that we had to fit into. 280 teaching minutes. In the con teacher contract it says a teacher can teach 280 minutes. You can't go over that no matter what. Study hall is considered teaching time. So a lot of schools in the state, the majority actually is a seven, eight, nine period a day of 45 to 50 minutes, the same classes all year long. A lot of schools kind of get away with saying teacher teaches five of those periods, six of those periods, and then what they do is they have a duty, and their duty is supervising lunch, supervising before school, after school, or study hall. So our teacher contract here is you can teach 280 minutes, you can have student contact at 310. So if a staff member does lunch duty, if they before school have to hang out and watch the hallways, any of that supervisory, that's that extra 30 minutes. They have to have a 50 minute uninterrupted prep. So no matter what, somewhere in there, whatever they do, 50 minutes is their prep time built in, but it can't be, oh, here's 30 here, here's 20 here, here's another chunk here. It has to be the same. 
We talked about the lunch, trying to separate our lunch because in the old building in Rushford, as much as we tried, we had the inner flow of, we had a high school group eat, and then an elementary group snuck in, then a high school group snuck in around that, and trying to separate and say the lunchroom is, elementary eats for an hour, then middle school, high school eats for an hour. So Just trying to keep that separate of those ages. And then again, we have shared staff K-12. And the big part of some of the schedules we looked at was they kind of worked, but we didn't have enough staff to do them because of that 280 in study hall. And I know you guys weren't the board then, but I really did not want to go with Mr. Ayler into the board and say, hey, we got this brand new building, and we're going to all come together, and I need a few more staff members. I just didn't think that was the best for anybody as, as it kind of went through. So we had to stay within those confines of what we had and what schedule worked for everybody. So what are other schools doing? The most popular in the state, like I said, is the seven to eight period day, anywhere from 42 to 55 minute classes. When we talked that, there were some middle school that's still kind of like that 50 minutes and there's a way to work that in. A lot of the high school staff was like, no, that's, that's too short. That's, we just can't get it done. That's those skinnies that are there. That is our hands-on classes in the egg, in the shop, in the art, facts. We're like, no, I, I can't do that. I can't get momentum going because it's too fast. And even some of our core classes just didn't feel that that offered them enough time. <coughs> There's schools that do a true block schedule. 90 minute class periods, you switch at the semester. So you have four classes first semester, then second semester you have four new classes, 90 minutes straight. This top one would be your cores, your English, math, science, social studies would be all year long for those 50 minutes and then your electives you kind of bounce in. And there are some others in the state that do a trimester type of schedule similar to we. There's some that are as little as 56 minutes and that was like a six period one and then there's 70 minutes for a five period and right now we're kind of in between that. So trimesters, as we went through, it was what's the best for all students. Now there's some group of students that semesters are probably better. There's some groups that trimesters are better. There's some teachers that like trimesters better. There's some teachers that like semesters better. That's the tough part is, I think even if we said we're not doing trimesters, we're done, we're going back to the old system, there'd probably be some teachers that wouldn't be happy with that either. So one of the biggies is more electives. A big example is in our old schedule, Mrs. Thompson taught foods and nutrition. So you took that class, and that could be a whole semester of 78 minutes. Sometimes it fit into a skinny. In here, we've been able to break that class up into basic foods, advanced foods, and nutrition. So one class turned into three. And that's a lot of areas you'll see that. In the shop, we used to have welding. We now have intro to welding and project welding. We used to have small gas engines. Now we've got intro to small gas engines advanced. I mean, you kind of get that, even in art. We're able to add those, and the theory with that is kids can dabble. If a kid goes in and really likes something, they can then take that and then take, if a kid goes into foods, oh, I really like foods, I can then take basic foods and advanced foods. I can take both of them the same. Or a kid could go in and take basic foods and be like, oh, I got enough, I'm done. When the old system, they just stay with the whole thing. So it gives those kids that chance, those ones that don't know what they want to do, they can dabble a little bit more and find their interest. It gives them more options. And that kid that really wants to dive in, so that was kind of the best of both worlds. In terms of the time of trimesters, because some staff was worried about that, for our core content classes, if a student has like Social 9A, Social 9B now, so they get their whole social studies for ninth grade, it's a very similar time to what our skinnies were before. All year long, it was probably two to three hours less, and it's more than our block. So in terms of the time during the year, it was very similar. The middle school, we put a couple options up there for them. They chose to have their study hall included into class versus separate. And the, the theory with that was, I take 50 minute class and I have study hall at the end. Well, if I take and I've all of a sudden I've got a question on my science homework, and now I'm over in study hall with Mr. Og. Mr. Og is a great teacher, I love Mr. Og, but if I've got a question on my science, I've got to go over and ask Mr. Tesh anyways. So they went to a 65 minute class because then they had more work time and could potentially have more. We're discussing a little bit of is that the best or not. 
but that's kind of what they voted at the time of, hey, that gives us the opportunity to have more work time with the kid and not have that study hall of bouncing around. The biggest concern, and this is one that, that I have too, is the gaps. There are gaps in there, which when we were in before in our old modified block at the high school, you could have your social nine, one whole semester, you were done. If you had it the skinny, you had it all year. Here you could potentially have first trimester, I could have social 9A during September, October, November. I could have the middle three months off and then pick up my social at the end. So you have that gap in there. And the concern teachers have, and I do too, is it's just that gap in there. And sometimes you have different classes. Some group might have a first and third trimester, and some might have that second and third trimester. So they come into third with just that different spots. But the gaps existed before, they just were different. And there's that example. English 9, as a freshman, I could have had English 9 first semester. And as a sophomore, I could have had English 10 second semester. So I could have had a whole year gap between taking English and the previous schedule. In this schedule, I don't get the whole year gap. I just get the gap of that class. So that is probably the biggest negative to them. In others, we said, I can't fit what I want into the schedule. We have more electives than more kids want to take. And that's more or less what I generally get is, there's so much I want to take, I can't take them all. That's, that's the good and the bad. And if we look at college credits, I did some research and I reached out to all of the area schools and kind of asked them, what do you guys offer for college credits? Either between concurrent enrollment, where kids get their they take the class here, our teachers teach it, they get college credit both here and at Minnesota State Southeast or at the University of Minnesota, an AP class, a CLEP, those test type ones. We have 18 courses that we offer. Now, they don't all run every year, but we have 18 courses. And as you see, the second most in the area, did it just fall asleep on me? The second most in the area behind Rochester and tied with Winona. And some other schools, like Penn offers seven college classes, Houston offers three, Fillmore Central four, Caledonia seven, Chatfield and Kingsland have 14, Dover Yota six. So we offer way more college credits than area schools do, which again, a good and a bad thing. The good is kids can pick what they want, the bad is if kids have similar schedules and I choose to take AP Biology and Kathy has the same schedule as me but instead of AP Biology she takes AP Psychology, well the likelihood that those two classes might be on the same hour if our schedules are the same besides that are pretty good. So it's one of those that if we had less college credit offerings for our upper level kids they could get into more of them, but then they'd be taking them just to take them. So this trimesters is, it makes it, it almost makes it harder to schedule, but it gives a wide variety of kids, if that makes sense. Some have said it's too much music, which our upper level stance can't get them all in because they need to take Spanish, which is recommended. If I'm a four year college kid, it's been drilled, I have to take Spanish. And then if I want to take band and choir. So, that's the same problem that we had in the old schedule. As I said, during one year we put band and choir during study hall actually. But they take three trimesters of music. So they've got 65 minutes of music right now all year long, which is more than any other class. Which is a lot, but as the numbers down there, as you can see, our numbers the last two years since we've been in trimesters have actually had the highest band that we've had in the last how many years in choir we're right up there too. The numbers in parentheses behind are, we had some students that said, oh, I, I took it first try, I can't get into it, I want to just take it one try and drop down. So that's kind of our high and low numbers. And I put those other years well, other years as well where we had kids maybe quit band or choir halfway through a year. And as a ninth grader and tenth grader, whether it was the old schedule or now, if you were a kid that wanted to be in band or choir, and wanted to take Spanish, that was your all your electives in the old schedule, the modified block, and in the current schedule. So 
I know some of them, they see, oh, I can't take any electives. So that didn't change from one to another. So that's kind of one of those myths, and I don't know if that's one that I've heard from people is, well, in the old one, I could. No, you, you couldn't. If you were a, and it's, it makes it tough because those kids see all these fun classes, but you couldn't. In the old one, if you wanted to be Spanish and band or choir, that's all you could take. In the new one. So that's actually what we tried. In 1617, we put band and choir in study hall and kind of tweak the schedule a little bit to give those students the opportunity to have one more elective and to take both band and choir. I had probably, I mean, it was a couple years ago, I think I had three, four parents that called and I probably had up to 10 kids that complained, Mr. Tim, this isn't fair. I don't get a study hall and I got to take an extra class. So you tried to solve one problem and there's one where I got another problem. And there again, there's our band and choir history. So just showing that even though with the change of trimesters, we have not hurt our band and choir. Now staff feedback. So I asked the staff some questions. I just see, what is your optimal length of a class period? <coughs> and this is middle school, high school teachers, the majority of them, over half said 65 to 70 minutes is what they feel is the optimal length of time. How many courses seem reasonable for a student to manage? during the day. Half said five, six, kind of there, but right around that five, six, kind of where we are and where we were. Ask, does the current schedule allow for college and career preparedness? So do you feel that a kid with our schedule can take classes to prepare themselves for college or a career if they're not a four-year college kid? 63 yes, 36 no. What do they feel is better? If we have fewer classes but longer periods, or more classes or shorter periods? And that's kind of the old, do we go to a true block schedule with four? Do we have eight classes, seven, eight classes in the 50 minutes? Kind of split between the middle school, high school. Do you feel students have enough choices? Obviously our, our staff felt they could too. Do students have enough opportunities to try new electives? Yes. And then what is their ideal schedule? 35% said stay with what we currently have. 30% said go to a seven or eight period a day. 20% was a 90 minute block. 10% said hybrid modified block, which was go to our old system. And then 5% said a 90 minute block with every other day rotation, which that's what some schools do to get rid of those gaps is you have you just go every other day on the block schedule. So you have English every other day all year long, and you have math every other day all year long. You just flip, 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 flip. So the staff kind of as we went through, that was the feedback they had. I just asked for some feedback too. And just some of the basic examples was, what's one thing, if you could change one thing in the schedule? There was one that said, you know, we need to have longer fight in the middle school which we have 44 minutes right now. And that's an option we're looking at it. Some said classes are too long. Some said classes are too short. Someone said no more gaps, which I agree with on there. One person said we have too much fluff in there. We offer too many classes. We need to offer less classes. One said I love it. There's nothing we need to change. At the end, I just said other thoughts. Are there other things there? Somebody said there's lots of classes. Students have said they can't fit in everything they want. Some have said middle school, high school needs to be different. It's okay. That was one of the questions I asked. And it was about a 50-50 split of, I didn't put it on there, of do you feel middle school and high school needs to be on the same exact time? There's a 50-50 split of yes and no. And the part there of regardless of if we're on a split or not, we need to make it a, a conscious effort to be fiscally responsible and not be so different that we have to hire teachers because as our classes are getting bigger, eventually we're going to have to have some people that teach a little at the high school and a little at the middle school as our big classes in the elementary work their way up. So we need to stay close. <coughs> some said stay with what we're doing, it's great, and some said go back. So it's kind of all over the board as to what our staff thinks and where we're at with the trimesters. But that's a long winded of how where we got, where we were to where we are now. Is what we're doing the best schedule? I don't know. Is there a best schedule? No, because if you look around the state of Minnesota, everyone's doing different stuff and they're moving around. The biggest thing that I like about this is a kid can dabble in the areas. We can have kids that can take, we've got A classes, 
shop classes, art classes, facts classes, business classes. Kids can dabble for one trimester in a lot of those elective areas, yet at the same time they can take their higher level classes, which are the two trimesters, college preparedness. So to me, this is the schedule that kind of modifies and brings it together both the best of our kids that are going to go to a tech school, our kids that are going to go right out and get a job, and our four-year college kids. They kind of mold it together. And as you saw, we're offering 18 college classes. We don't run those every year. There's some on there that we don't run. So if you look at this year's schedule, there's not 18 on there, but that's what we offer. And that's what I ask others for. What do you offer? And we're that many. So it's one of those we have a lot to offer kids, and it's probably one of those we have too much. But I'd rather have too much and work our way down than not have enough and see kids go on their spots. So, questions off of that? Because I know I was very long-winded with it, and, but sometimes where we are to where we get to be and used to be, now you guys are the board. Too. I don't have a question, but I will uh, <coughs> offer a statement of support for the fact that we are one of the few schools in southeastern Minnesota that have the amount of courses that we have for career and college ready students. So uh, I hope that the board will take a look at that and, and really view that as a strength for our schedule. It does create that flexibility as a, as a district. Last year you made a difficult decision to um, enhance our OIC program and in turn then offer uh, business education courses that we were lacking. Uh, so. Thanks to the flexibility of this schedule, we are able to implement that program. So um, I think the advantages outweigh the disadvantages as far as the flexibility it creates and the opportunity it gives to our students. And to build on that, which just maybe not even schedule related, but there's, I think we are one of the few smaller schools, now Winona of course has it, but one of the smaller schools that has that elective option of everything. You go to Caledonia when we were doing tours of the new building. They have a fax room in Caledonia that is still sitting empty today when we toured it three years ago, was sitting empty because they don't have someone to teach fax, so they don't offer that. We didn't offer business up till last year. La Crescent doesn't offer business. Mabel Canton just has tech ed. They don't have a, an egg program. So you kind of go around and kind of pick and choose where we have that. We actually have everything to offer. And then we started that school within a school for some of our kids to keep them from going to ALC. And knock on wood, we haven't lost any this year. So it's working. There's some kids eventually that, you know, we're still going to lose kids because that's a better fit for them. But some of those students that we would have probably, that we've lost to the ALC in the past, this year we've been able to hold on to them for a little bit longer and meet their needs. And I think the important part of that is we're able to support the students. We're, we've built it into our schedule. We recognized that in the past, that was something that was concerning to us, the fact that we had students that were uh, pursuing that uh, online courses, uh, some fl additional flexibility. But with the program that we currently have this year, we're recognizing some of the challenges of those students that they face, and then we're assisting the students in, in making uh, good decisions and making sure that they're supported and getting the necessary credits that they need to graduate. I have um, two comments I wanted to make. First of all, I thought that was a really good presentation. I didn't think you were long with it at all. And I appreciate it being here because I wasn't on the board. <coughs> um, so the first thing I want to say is that, you know, and I can really appreciate that it's got to be a work in progress trying to figure out how to schedule, you know, how to meet all the needs. And so, um, you know, I can appreciate that you're trying new things. It does kind of sound to me like, even what you're saying, you're not really quite there yet. I mean, um, as you said, one of the problems is that the students, especially I think if they're if they're college bound and need that foreign language, they can't take electives, and, and if they're also in band. And, and you said this hasn't really improved that situation, which I'm glad you know because that's some of the complaints I I heard. So now I can say it is the same. Um, also, it looked like only 35 percent of the staff is happy with it. You know, wants to stick with it. And I think on your earlier slide, it looked like it's probably the least common scheduling in the state. Um, yeah, I mean, percent. from, you know, based off of... So others have found some issues with it too, I guess. Um, well, and I don't know if they found, like I said, this is, this is the most popular in the state by far. Mm -hmm. And this one up here, we had, okay, so when we were doing the scheduling committee, 
that one was no, 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 we don't want that, no. And that's what I even went to if we look at here, the optimal class time was 55%. I mean, half of our staff picked that. And here, I mean, we got middle school, and I look, this one is majority, you know, middle school staff picked that. So it's kind of an all over, and that's like I said, it's all over the place. So if all of a sudden we walked in and said, yep, we know it's the least common in the state, but we're going to go to what the most common in the state is. I think you probably get just as many emails or concerns from people saying, we don't like this one. Yep, I, I understand. I, I can appreciate that. And also, I can appreciate that you put out a call, hey, we're going to have a committee to look at scheduling and, and hardly anybody responds. I, I know that's reality. Um, I, and I am, I'm glad it's working out with colleges because it, it struck me that colleges are all on semesters mm -hmm. in Minnesota. So this is, this is very different from the college classes they're taking. Um, I guess the only other thing I wanted to say, and I, I had been one that asked for an explanation of this because I have in the past year, I can count six, at least six different individuals that have talked to me about being unhappy with the trimesters. Um, and largely, I think they did expect it to solve some problems with the old schedule that it didn't. Uh, and, you know, without getting into the details, I, I know you've researched it, I, you know, which is better, which is not. But the only thing that, that concerned me was that each of those individuals that talked to me, they all were under the impression this is a one-year trial, and then we're going to we're going to take get feedback from faculty, probably from parents and students. You know, and it was it was teachers and parents that told me we thought it was just for one year, and then we're going to really look at it. And then they all felt like that. The perception is that that wasn't done. You know, so I, I, my only concern is that if we say we're going to do something, I want to make sure we do it. You know, or if we're not really going to look at it after. And that was never, yep. Yeah, and that was never told us. We went through and we said we're switching to the new one. And there were staff members that just said there were staff members that were under the assumption that it was a one-year trial. And and maybe their when they brought it up at meet and confer meetings, I said, well, last year if we were going to only have a one-year, because we're right in the thick of scheduling right now for next year. So if it would have been a one-year trial, we would have had to make the decision to change classes last year in September, October. So it would have been a month into the schedule before we could even, so you don't even go through a full year. So what I told people when they asked, they said, we at least have to go three years with it. Because you scheduled last year, now if, year, now if this year we're starting to look at it, we're already in the thick of scheduling. So now we're looking at it right at this time. If we make the decision to switch or go somewhere else, now next year we have time to research and put together the best schedule. So that was, I think, just the assumption of people are used to stuff, and change is hard for people. That's always the toughest I mean, thing. It, wasn't just, it was uh, parents, too. Some of the, I heard from a couple of these that said they thought it was a one-year trial, and they were waiting to be asked you know, what they thought about it. So somehow that idea, if you're right, it got out there, that it, was, it would be reviewed after okay. a year. And, the, and we spent a lot, like I said, there was, there was a reason that in I mean, this building opened in the fall of 2017. There was a reason it was January of 2016. So a year and a half before this building opened that we started down this road and we met those numerous times and put it together. And then once the decision was made, staff that summer before they came here, we used a lot of curriculum writing dollars in professional development for staff to make their classes change from a semester or a skinny into the trimester because that was the concern of staff. So a lot of time, effort, finances, resources was meant to go with it. And like I said, I'm not, and I know there's some staff members that have said, because I came from a trimester in Prague, like, well, you just like us, that's where we're going. There, there are flaws with it. And as I hope as you saw as I talked tonight, there are flaws and I get there are flaws. The tough thing that is, is those parents that I've talked to and those teachers, sometimes they're looking in their lens of my kid was best for my kid, and the teacher is my subject was best for my subject. Where my job is to look at what's best for 200 plus high school kids, 350 middle school high school kids. And it's one of those of, to me, that, that dabbling, that ability of the kid that walks in and how many kids in high school have no clue what they want to do. There's some that are coming in with, I'm on that track, I'm on the four-year track, I'm going, boom, here we go. Spanish and band, that, that's kind of the, like I said, I don't know if there's a schedule that fixes that. 
you go back to that modified block you put in study hall, but then as soon as I did that, as I said, I had people that didn't like that, so then they had to take an extra class, and they didn't get a study hall like everybody else. So you're kind of caught in there, but that kid that comes in that has no clue what they want to do, they can walk in and take three months of business, I can take three months of facts, I can take three months of voeg, I can take these little things, and then once I find it, then I can dive in where I couldn't before. So. Like I said, it's not perfect by no me by any means. We're trying to tweak it as we go, but based off, I mean, the feedback here is that it's only 35 percent, but then the next one goes to 30 percent here, which they all said they do not. Like I said, the, the majority of high school staff was absolutely no, no, no. And we go down to a 90-minute block. The modified block had two people. 10 percent. So again, like I said, I, I don't know what the answer is. We can look at it. I just think it's one of those of if we scrap it and change it, you might have eight other parents call and say, it was going great, why did we change it? Well, I believe it takes, like you said, three years or more to see if something works and, you know, to get the bugs out of it or, you know, you're, you're still on top of it, I think switching stuff around, trying to make stuff work. And I have a child that has no idea what she wants to do yet, and she's going to be a senior next year. So I definitely like the concept, concept of all the classes. And we've made it work nicely with um, Minnesota State Southeast, which is a great partnership we have with them. It's, I mean, I can call Joe Ponce, what's your name, the Dean of Academics over there. And we talk through these things all the time. And when we went to trimesters, that was one of my first phone calls was, what class, how many hours do they have to have for college credit, all these things. We can actually fit a three credit college class in one of our trimesters due to hours. And we have some that did that intro, our um, Hispanic cultures used to be a semester class. We've shrunk it down and fit that in there. Some of our math, we've got college algebra, stats, pre calc that all fit into one. Some teachers that offer classes there, sociology, human bio, said we want two trimesters to do it. So that fits in okay over there. Either way it works, they know our system now, and when kids take it and don't, they fit them in. And Mrs. Hellborn does a great job talking up there with, the, with Minnesota State Southeast, so we have a nice spot with that. But we've been able to get that where it feels more like a college class and push it. Then we have some kids that take that online college classes. And it works out nicely there because in the old system, it said, we said, and this is any PSEO class, four college credits equals one credit here at the school. And that's what a lot of high schools do. Well, a lot of college classes are three credits, so kids would have to take like two classes, where now if a kid takes a PSEO, it takes a first semester and a second semester one, whether it be online or on for one hour a day, that's six credits at college. We can pull them from one hour each trimester to give them an extra hour to work on that class. Each of ours is worth half a credit, so three trimesters is a credit and a half. Six credits, credit and a half work actually really nice together. So if a student takes one each semester, they get an hour off each try and it works really nice together too. So that's one of those perks of, that works better than the old system where they had to either try to find a four credit or take five even though they only wanted three. Or one semester they took three, the next semester they took six to kind of piece it together. So there again, it goes to some positives, some negatives. So this is the second year, right? Next yes. Year, maybe we can just sort of informally plan on you coming back and talking about it in a year. And yeah, that would be excellent. Do you want to just mention to the board, too, the partnership that we have with uh, Good Shepherd? Yes, we created a... Um, we call it intro or a pathway to CNA. So we, we formed a partnership through, and we were one of the first in the state, there's a couple of in the state, but now students have the ability to get their CNA license through the day here at school. So we have Aaron Thompson teaches a healthcare core class for one trimester, and then the next trimester she team teaches with Dana Thompson, certified nurse up at Good Shepherd. They get the hands-on piece, and then when students are done with those two courses, they still have 24 hours of practicum or internship that they do with Good Shepherd. They allow our kids to do that up there, and then they take the test. And if they do that, they get their CNA license. 
which normally they have to do in the summers at night, stuff like that. So another partnership we have. Um, yeah, Bonnie, I can, I can definitely come back next year and say how it's going. I can give a survey out again next year to staff and see if anyone changes their opinions on what we do. There's always, I so said, there's already a few little tweaks in, in the schedule for next year to try to make it a little bit better for people. I said, I'm I, somewhat I, checking with parents too, you know, because I, I understand you can't base this all on staff preference either because, you know, you need, you need to look at what's best for the students and, yep. and all groups of students. And, yep, and so. parents, I, and I, I wish I could say I know that each year for our scheduling meetings, we invite parents to come in and meet and listen and talk on the scheduling meetings and two years ago the year that we transferred from old schedule to this one after the board approved it in october of 16 that january of 17 as we knew we were going to switch to it we took extra time we had i think three different meetings with students to explain the difference and when they signed up for classes we offered two nights for parents to come in and they were very, very sporadically. I mean, I, I can't quote numbers, but there was very few parents in there as we explained through. And we tried to invite parents in to talk schedules. This year we went down to just one meeting with students, parent-teacher conferences, invited all 8th through 11th grade parents to come in, be part of it, ask questions. And Jenny led it. She said she had 18 parents here. So out of, I mean, it's one of those things where we invite, 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 invite to try to get them to come in. And if parents want, I, I encourage, I've had a few parents that have reached out to me and then you explain it. And like I said, that, that's the tough part is eight to 10 parents that really want one thing, we switch it to help their kids and then a new eight to 10 are gonna come in and say this is wrong. So, we'll keep working. I definitely, I mean, if you guys get questions or concerns, definitely you can email me with them and I can try to answer them the best I can. And then we can go from there too as we keep going, trying to make what's best for all our kids. And that, that's the unique thing that we get is we have kids in the building that want to just get through four years and when they graduate, they want to get a job and that's what they're doing. And we've got another kid that walks in the same exact class that is going to four, eight years of college. And we've got to find a way to help them both while they're here. Any other questions? Mr. Thanks, Dick. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Moving on to uh, 8B, uh, we have a 1920 uh, early retirement guideline for teachers, which is similar to what we've done in the past. Yes, if I may, on uh, page 31 in the packet, uh, we uh, originally started out with a one year incentive, and now we've bumped it up to two years. For those that are considering retirement, it's, uh, it works out to just under $9,000 of uh, health insurance that we provide the, <coughs> to the, uh, those that are considering it. Um, I will ask the board if uh, where you're at with this. Um, I did receive uh, confirmation. Uh, we don't have a lot of people that would qualify for this, but if you were to bump it to three years, um, it might entice some of those that are on the fence. So just need to hear from you. Um, it is a cost savings to us as a district. It's an incentive. To, uh, and we'll put that out there for you to mull over here and see what you can The nice thing about this is that it's a year-to-year -year, uh, option that the district provides. Uh, so it's not part of the master agreement, even though we've received some pressure to make it a part of the master agreement. Um, so it's open for discussion. Would be uh, happy to answer any questions, concerns you have, or uh, get a feel from you on entertaining the idea of moving this to a three-year incentive. Oh, One for sure. And they're on the fence. Uh, they, they, two is an iffy, three is a definite go. So. I agree two years. Okay. It's, 
It's not something we have to do. Any, I mean, no, under, yeah. uh, no. You, you're not required. It's just a, an option that you give employees to consider. Uh, and then I'll go on record as saying it is a cost savings to us if someone. Is it considerable, Chuck, the cost savings? Uh, yes. <coughs> it is. It's still very conducive for the district to provide that as well. And again, you're not locked in because if you can do it, you can say to the individuals that for one year only we're offering a three year incentive. And you have to keep in mind that if somebody is 62 years of age, that gives them three years of health insurance benefits until they get to 65 where Medicare kicks in. That's the incentive. Obviously, you know. Not everybody can withstand a $9,000 uh, expense every year, uh, but if they know that that incentive is there, then that makes it even more uh, inviting to them to give that consideration. When you say money just because you hire teachers, that's Correct. And this just applies to teachers, right? It does. I would be in favor of extending that to three years. I just it's a cost savings and I don't know. And like you said, we can change if we want to go back to two years. Or you can maintain it as it currently is. allow me to gather a little bit more information, find out how many would be interested, then I can have the, the cost breakdown for you as well. I'd appreciate that. Do we have to do it this Friday? <coughs>
write it in that. All in favor of the case saying aye. Could you check to see if she can stay for a minute? Because she needs to be here for my retraction statement. Oh. It, it was in the Fillmore County Journal. If she's going to leave early, then I'll make my retraction statement now. Do okay, we have a motion uh, to uh, table the uh, item 8B of new business? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The uh, item 8C is to approve the uh, 1920 school year calendar draft. draft. It's on page 32 uh, in, our, uh, in your packet, and uh, again, this is something that uh, we met administratively to look at and uh, decided to uh, tweak it a little bit so that uh, our, our students and staff are done at the end of May. So we don't have either students or staff coming back on a Monday in June. So uh, again, we share this with our DEA. And, uh, she had to leave to go to the city council meeting. She's ready okay. for that. Can you just email her your statement? Sure. So it gets into repeat because. Thank you. Yeah. So yes. Uh, so this is just a draft. We invite you to take a look at it, and uh, we're waiting to hear back from our DEA as well. Any comments on the uh, proposed schedule? Not necessarily, no. Anybody have any comments on it? Uh, if you do, uh, please don't hesitate to let us know. Uh, there was some concern, I'll be honest with you, there was some concern about coming back on uh, Thursday, January 2nd, uh, only two days, the 2nd and 3rd take the full two weeks off, but if we do that, then it pushes us to uh, have students attend school on the 29th, and, uh, and then we have teachers coming back on Monday, June 1st, so we look at that, and they'll do it. No, I know, and, and so it's really tight, and so, uh, yeah, so, you know, something, you know, as you look at it next year, obviously, you probably would not come back for one day on a Friday. January, so you have to look at how you're going to make that work. So we, in essence, what we what happened is in April uh, um, we lost uh, Easter Monday, so that might be concerning to some parents. But uh, if you look at April 9th, that's a scheduled early dismissal for parent-teacher conferences. So there is uh, that extended time in there as well. So. Looking at all the options uh, administratively, uh, my, my leadership team took a, uh, a you know the magnifying glass out, and went over it, uh, and uh, this is what we have decided would be best for everyone concerned. And once we hear back from RPA, we'll bring it to you for approval at the next board meeting. Okay. Any uh, comments uh, for uh, the staff? Okay, moving on to uh, 8D, new business, uh, approve the co-op agreement with Lewiston Altura Schools for boys and girls golf. I'm going to turn that over to Mr. Bibadarp. He's going to walk you through this as to uh, the request from Lewiston Altura to join forces with us. Yeah, I, um, I know I talked to you, I think it was almost, well, some of you, two months ago. Uh, when we first started exploring this option, uh, part of which um, is led by the fact that uh, Lewis Altura's golf course has announced that it's closing, subject to the sale to a potential buyer, and as of um, middle of January, they had no buyer to do that, um, which is making us look forward. What is our best forward, go forward strategy? Um, this could be advantageous both for Lewis and Altura and giving them a course that's closer um, than any other option for them. Um, gives us an ad advantage of gaining additional athletes and, and that's kind of all spelled out in that resolution that you should have a copy of um, in terms of the need for cooperative resolution that we put together. Um, how we see this is a great fit. We already are co-op with Lewis and Altura for cross country. We're also co-op with them for wrestling. Um, so this would be a, a third one. So we have a co-op in the fall, we have a co-op in the winter, and this would be a co-op in the spring. Run very similar, only difference is we would be the host school um, from a 
who makes the formal schedule and contact person from the state high school league. That would be our school district instead of theirs. But we work seamlessly uh, between the two schools, the kids, everything has, has been great with our existing co-ops that we have with them. So we see this as a, a huge advantage moving forward. What does Lewiston bring to the table? They bring um, more participants, which makes us be able to field a full boys team and a girls team. By being able to do that, we can grow future, um, future numbers as well, obviously, if, if you are able to fully participate. Um, it can lead to more participation in the future. How we've been doing it, as well as how they've been doing it, is there's not enough to have a full varsity and a full JV, so when we play other teams in the conference, for example, we're going with partial teams, or we, in our case for the girls, two years ago we had four, so we were able to compete, even though a full varsity is six. Last year we were down to two girls. So they golfed, but they truly weren't participating as a team. So the co-op, join the numbers, that's great. We have a course we're practicing on, they have an indoor golf facility um, that they have access to, so it's hitting into simulators. Um, so they bring that to the table for us. So if we have a terrible winter that extends into the spring like it did last year, we hit into some nets for weeks and weeks and weeks. But the simulator um, and practice green that they have over there that they have access to would be an advantage to us. There is the downside in terms of transportation. You know, when they come here to practice, they it's further distance than when they went to the Lewiston Golf Course, but. That's not an option for them. If we do go um, for practices over there, we would incur a transportation cost. But when it comes to the meets, we would split the cost of transportation. When it gets to the entry fees for some tournaments we play in, we would split that. Um, so it would be a cost savings in that respect. So uh, as far as all the conversation with our existing coaches, as well as with Lewis and Alter on their side, their activities director, as well as their coaches, very excited about what this can mean for us. Um, for the strength of the unified program. As far as the formal steps for this, um, there's a number of different steps that are involved. One is getting board approval on both school district sides, so obviously bringing that to you tonight. For formal approval, uh, they're bringing that to, at Lewiston's next board meeting on February 11th, so that would be from the board side of it. There also has to be support from our, our conference that we participate in, of which we sent a survey, and that was unanimously in, in favor of supporting the boys and girls golf co-op. And then at the region level, so region 1A, um, that's the meeting that uh, Mr. Tim attended on January 23rd, where they formally approved the resolution uh, from the region level um, to, to go forward with this. So it's kind of all these things in play, um, but that would be our next step after board approval is just to, to finalize that at the State High School League, um, assuming obviously we get your support and, and Lewiston's support. Uh, I do have correspondence, which I've shared with Mr. Ayler, from the principal as well as superintendent as well as activities director at Lewis Van Altura, and they're all very supportive of this on their side. So it's not like we're, we're pushing for one thing and they're thinking something different. We're all unified in this. So I would welcome any questions you would have, but um, what, what we'd be looking at is pretty much you know, spelled out in this, the one-page resolution, and then if you're approving of it, then we would need a signature on the form that we present this application for cooperative sponsorship to the State High School League. I make a motion to approve the co-op agreement with Lewiston Alter and Golf. Uh, Dan, I do have a question on uh, the, the two head coaches. Is that, uh, that you anticipate any issues with that? Don't anticipate any issues with that at all. What we truly have is a minimum of four teams. If we have a, a varsity boys, varsity girls, and that's two head coaches, for, you know, if they split it up, boys and girls, um, and then as well as a JV boys, a JV girls, and then with our numbers, even a junior high position as well. So in talking with them, the, the three coach set up um, two head coaches or co-head coaches with an assistant whether that assistant is tabbed as a JV assistant or a junior high assistant, it would be an assistant coach that would assist with all of that. Um, again, that was something, unified consensus that that is a good fit for what, where we project numbers to be. And we retain the two coaches we have now? Uh, Correct, and then bring on, the, that's subject to obviously the approval of the co-op, um, the, the theory or the, the the plan would be to retain our two coaches as well as one coach from Lewis and Alter, correct. 
And as you see on there, the assistant position would actually be split, split in terms of the financing of that. So the cost sharing, Lewiston would help contribute towards that, that third coach. Okay, anybody else have any questions? We have a motion to approve. Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Thank you. We move on to item uh, eight, uh, E, approve the 2018-2020 uh, ES Educational Support Personnel Contract. Page 35. Yes. John Linder and Chris Grinland were involved in the negotiation process. We went through mediation, and uh, as a result of the mediation, we reached a tentative agreement uh, to bring, bring this to the board. Uh, we made some adjustments. Uh, an example of what that would be administrative assistance. We bumped uh, 50 cents right off the bat to, to make some corrections there and, and to balance the, the wages. We did some cost comparison with other districts, and uh, uh, this is the offer that we uh, were able to uh, come to terms with, and we are seeking board approval this evening on the uh, employee support staff, uh, employee support personnel uh, contract for this year as well as next year. Well, I can just add, we, uh, well, uh, put a little bit more into the bottom end at the, at the beginning because uh, I think we recognize that the, uh, the entry level uh, salary wages were uh, needed to be up a little bit. The, the job economy is picking up and there's a lot of options out there for uh, some of these folks. So um, we did bump that a little bit. So uh, we did, I understand they, their union approved it. They did, yes. It represents about a, a 9.88% uh, increase uh, overall in two years. So um, we certainly appreciate the, the conversations that we had and some of the resolutions that we came to as far as working with them and, uh, and coming to terms as far as um, creating a, a salary schedule that they can live with. Any questions on the uh, post, uh, contract agreement? Not uh, for a motion. If I may, I just let me interject here. Uh, we have worked with the city on coming up with some options, and uh, the last uh, meeting we had with them, the, the city presented their proposal, and I've shared that with many of you as well. Uh, I have not uh, put that on the docket for you to address, 
But uh, we have ongoing conversations and our facilities committee has been working with the city, so I would invite or encourage that we continue those conversations. Um, and I know that uh, other board members here have some concerns about uh, the city's uh, intention of what uh, their plan is to do with the building. And so um, I think that it would be advisable for the district to allow the facilities committee to work through that process. I did put it out there because I know that you were busy with the uh, hiring process here for the superintendent. So I didn't want to have that additional uh, item uh, uh, detracting from your efforts to go ahead and hire a superintendent here. But uh, I have every intention to pull together the facilities committee and get everybody up to speed as to how we envision to move forward with that, that proposal and to address, as Chris has indicated here, the pressure is increasing uh, to uh, do something with the building, obviously. And, uh, so I that you bring that up tonight. I did have an inquiry today on someone that wants to walk through the building tomorrow, and and so I'm going to give that person the opportunity to take a look at the building and uh, see what they uh, come forward uh, with. So can we table this till February? It's up to you. It's entirely up to you. Chris is just. Chris is putting it out here for discussion. And, uh, so. Do you do you know what it, what does it cost the district uh, per month to have the school board? Right now, it's not costing us anything because we don't have any insurance on it. We're not heating it. Uh, we have a, a minimum fee for electricity. We didn't turn the electricity off, but that's the only cost that you're incurring right now. Uh, no, the, the, it, it's not that we, we address that issue, and then part of that issue is uh, what Val is mentioning, that uh, there was some uh, warping that took place on the gym floor in the northwest corner, and that is mainly due because of no heat in the building. Okay, so. so there's no liability insurance on the building? Mm -hmm. There is. Yeah, we have liability. We have liability so insurance. Yes. Okay. If someone were to slip or fall on the sidewalk, yes. And we're doing our best to keep those cleared and uh, working to make sure that that's addressed as well. So there is a cost? There is a cost, yes. There okay. is. Minimum cost. A couple of things to think about. I, you know, I have you know, <coughs> given this a lot of thought over the, over the course of a long time. And, um, you know, I don't think there's any urgency to doing this for the cities. We, we call, in our discussions, we called that Plan B, and that even the city referred to as Plan B. Uh, and we, we did not offer uh, the Peterson building, the, the middle school, to the city of Peterson. Uh, I'm not sure that, that they wanted it, so I mean, it may not have been a discussion, but that, that certainly uh, is a factor. The other is, uh, you know, this school district encompasses more than just the city of Rushford. And we need to take that into consideration uh, if we're going to be offering it uh, to the city of Rushford. Uh, the other point is that it may have some value. I, you know, I don't know that we have a tested market. Uh, I, I would certainly like to consider that, see if there is interest in it. It, it might be minimal, uh, it might be more than minimal, I, I, I don't know. Um, the other factor is the city, uh, they want to knock the building down. Ultimately, that may be what has to happen, but I suspect there may be some issue with that, you know, out of the gate. Uh, you know, there may be some people that are not happy about that, but again, you know, I mean, it, it may be that that's what the market determines has to be done, but um, I, I, I don't see the, uh, you know, I, I, it's interesting to test the market. market and, uh, and that's, that's just some thoughts on it. I hope that maybe we'll, um, we will start to we'll have to approach with some urgency testing the market. Mm -hmm. I, I really think we need to exhaust <coughs> all our avenues before we, um, before we hand it over to the city. By the way, that's, I mean, I doubt it's more than a month. So, you're <laughs> right. <laughs> I do just try to get as much as you could. I mean, I get the point, but I think, I, I wasn't aware of it, whether we had really exhausted other avenues, I don't think we have. So. That would be my hope. I'm not making a whole thing, but that would be continued. Other, because I, I would just like to know a plan. I don't know if the city can really give us a definite plan. Well, they
they don't. They, their plan is to knock it down, and that is that's their plan, and then we'll go from there. And, and, and that's fine. Uh, but once it's down, that is there is no other option. So, uh, you know, that, uh, and you make a good point. There's really two other municipalities with all the partnerships. So plus townships. And, and yeah, yeah. So if we just hand over to the city of Well, we've had ongoing conversations yeah. with the city, and so um, there hasn't been a real sense of direction here from the facilities committee as to we we processed through all of the various steps. We had a plan A yeah. that didn't come to fruition, and then the city decided they wanted to move uh, this forward and came up with a plan B. So plan B needs to be mulled over by you as a board, and then decide. Uh, which direction you wish to go. And we have not advertised the building. So.
those uh, individuals and to provide them the opportunity to work with our students. They're a nice addition to our school family. A note of thanks to the Rushford Lions. Uh, each month they come in for one week uh, out of the month uh, to assist with uh, uh, safety patrol, so we're indebted to them and uh, we thank them for their willingness to help us out with that. The DNR grant, uh, I received some additional information in regards to the timeline. The grant would be submitted this year and if approved, construction would take place in the summer of 2020, so it would not conflict with our plans to move forward with the uh, <coughs> redevelopment uh, of the uh, current practice field that we have so we can spread those out and not be conflicting, which would be very welcome. So that is my update. So you, you had an issue uh, retraction or what was it? Yeah I have a retraction statement at the end of the board meeting and I'll Okay you want to do that now? I can do it now. Why don't you do it now? Okay. Sure. The retraction statement is uh, centers around, uh, and I I don't deny that I said said this. Uh, if you recall, we had we had a conversation about the DNR grant, and uh, my quote is is that my fear was that the grant doesn't happen; it will stay in limbo for a long time. Uh, we bit the bullet when it came to Pine Meadows and did not have help from the city on that project. So the offense is that I referenced that we did not have help, and I should have used the word financial help from the city. The city did help in that uh, with the construction that took place down with Highway 43, the city workers were instrumental in providing the leadership in, in getting the, the lights moved down and working with us to make the decision to move across the street and then extended onto Highway 4, you know, across Highway 43. So I'm indebted to, to uh, the city letting me know that uh, they took offense to my words. I did call uh, Tony Clyde, the city uh, administrator, and extended my apologies for my comment and reference. Uh, so I just wanted you as a board to understand my sensitivity to that was not to diminish anything that the city has provided us throughout that whole process. Uh, as we <coughs> viewed it, and as you as a district viewed it, uh, we went a year without the sidewalk in place. It was deemed at that time, uh, based on community feedback, that something needed to be done. If you recall, we uh, put in for the uh, Safe Schools grant three years running. We're denied all three years. Uh, so in reference to saying that as a district, you bit the bullet, yes, you did financially, and we are indebted and thankful for the city's contribution to making that happen as well. That concludes my retraction statement. <laughs> <laughs> More of a clarification. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, yeah, the point taken. So. Yes. All right. Anything else, Mr. Ehrlich? Thank you. Uh, Ms. Lawson. Um, I'll just keep it short. If you have school tomorrow, uh, we have two classes going after school with high diving and skill cases and the babies and schedule from last week, so um, we'll have some busy kids after school. Um, youth dance will be starting up again in February, so that's always fun for our little girls. Uh, youth rec uh, went really well in December. 75 participants in youth basketball, 53 in Mac Club Wrestling, they had a huge tournament on the 5th that we even tried to drive by that day, they were very busy, um, and they did a wonderful job. Open Gyms um, started uh, this last weekend and the weekend before, and I'll go run through February, I have volunteers lined up, but we are having a lot of students coming, so we have over 50 kids, so we need more volunteers um, to help with that. Adult enrichment, uh, we have a couple classes going on there, and then at the rec, Badminton started, we're looking at pickleball and kind of tapping into Craig Hobinson to lead that one for me who loves pickleball. So um, look for that to come in March. And then Peak Fitness, which is another big hit for our staff. We did a wellness grant to help offset that, uh, the cost of that. And um, it's going over very well. We have 19 participants. So that was very fun. And with the wellness grant, too, we have an opportunity to receive more money. So I'm working on it that with that group of people that are in that class to kind of come up with different ideas um, for our fitness center 
to help for our employees. So we have some with posters and different things like that, but we're working on it. Um, Kids Club, we stay pretty busy. We're up from last year. We're up to 12 in the morning and 30 in the afternoon. And then Jennifer Thorson, we've been pretty fortunate with our student teachers, as Mr. Yetler pointed out. Uh, that's who helps us out after school, and it's a great opportunity for them. And, uh, and it helps us as well to have that adult leadership in the afternoon for our kids. And then uh, Lillaby, we they had the Christmas program. That went really well. And then we're planning right now for next year. So we're looking to do a pre changes, but we're in the planning stages of that. Um, I'll go over the changes next month. And then ECFB, Heather's doing a wonderful job. She had a first ECFB Open Gym. We're doing it different this year. We tried to do it during the week last year, and it just doesn't go because of space and it's just so busy in our, in our building. So we're doing it at the same time as our open gyms here to have a wrestling room for ECFB Open Gym so on Sunday afternoon. So that's kind of a fun family activity for our, our community members. And then summer planning room is a big for that as well. The other thing I've been busy working on, I just put in my report was a facility checklist. We're just getting caught up on making different signs and different posters and different things on the door. So if you see that walking around the building, that's where we're kind of doing the updating. And then also the fitness center, just working on maintaining that, the memberships, and the different groups that come in here from police officers to senior citizens to firemen to college students, and just kind of keeping them all straight. So I'll give you another update on that next one. Thank you. Mr. Shepard, you're yeah. school. Yes, thank you. Um, the top third bullet down was the um, fifth grade raising $400. And that's to me is just wonderful for Gabby, which many of us have read her story. She's a little over one now from Harmony, Fighting Cancer, her whole funding page. But the fifth grade had enough, you know thoughtful hearts and that they raise money for that little girl who has a, obviously a battle going on. Um, some of the opportunities we have for our students with the Winona Symphony Orchestra, which two through five will be going to soon. We also have two plays coming. One Winona will be coming here and a play um, from a group from La Crosse will also be coming here in the next month and a half too. So those are just nice opportunities for a lot of kids who may not get to go see an orchestra and all those, and the plays are just fun and it's, it's great opportunities with Prairie Fire here um, and the plays for the older kids through Mr. Musselman are just great opportunities for um, our young children. Kindergarten registration is set for the 15th. We're going to do PTC Mass this year, which works well for our parent-teacher conferences and the early childhood does that as well now. I've had Dan and Kila working on um, setting that up for kindergarten registration coming up here shortly. The Great Kids uh, Winona Health Program we started last year, and Mrs. Brown is our fourth grade um, FIA teacher now. So it is um, eight weeks, and the kids love it. All fourth grade students, 62 of them, will be in the gym. There are 10 or 11 Winona State students who come um, with the leader from Winona Health. Um, not sure who that is this year, but they come and do an entire 50-minute program with these kids. They have, um, it, when I peeked in um, last year, it was just wonderful seeing all these college kids with the young kids, and if anyone's around during that time, it's uh, 2.10 until 3 o'clock, so it's, it's worth checking it out. Our early dismissal for conferences really goes well for the elementary, and our attendance was wonderful again. Um, elementary just is. Um, even in the spring, there's a real nice attendance. Um, one of the big thing I want to do is what Mrs. King is doing over um, the Christmas break. A lot of her 11 EL students went, their families went to their homes in Mexico or wherever. So she had some time, and instead of kind of searching what to do, she emailed the entire staff, elementary staff, saying, I'll come into your room. We'll learn a little bit more. We'll teach a little bit this, the you know cultural sensitivity. And the teachers just rose to the occasion. And I attended several of them. One that I attended was a fourth grade classroom where this boy brought his mom in. And she sat in front, and she had a slideshow and everything with Mrs. King. And he explained a little, and the mom would explain and where they're from, what it looked like, how it's changed. All this little guy's never been there. She they came to the United States when 
she was pregnant with him. It was just so, the class was just amazed. And at the end, this little guy went up and gave his mom a hug. And it was just so wonderful. And I was in a four, uh, first grade classroom that another mom came into. And she was pretty quiet. But the little boy was uh, just talk, 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 talk. So <laughs> it was, both of them were nice and just an opportunity. And Mrs. King did such a nice, nice job um, coming up with wonderful ideas and including everyone. And, um, so. It's really great. Everybody's back to so she's back to her usual routine. But yeah, so a lot of good things happening. Of course, our e-learning day from today goes really well in elementary. I know it can be kind of challenging for the middle school, high school, but for elementary, teachers have a really good plan in place and they're doing really well. So. Thank you. Okay. Any questions for Mr. Sherman? Okay. Yes, I'll do the high school, and again, my thanks to uh, Mr. Jim for the uh, research he did and, and present his presentation tonight on the trial for <coughs> scheduling, and uh, we hope that uh, that answers some questions as you get board members. Sometimes you get confronted about uh, this isn't right or that isn't right, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know how that works, but uh, again, my thanks to him for the. Time and effort he put into his presentation tonight. Uh, again, I personally am uh, very impressed with uh, the fact that we can offer what we're offering. And so that's all part of that. Uh, the registration process is underway. <coughs> so um, he's uh, going to be working with uh, Mrs. Hilcomo at uh, the informational meetings as far as the registration process. So they have a collaborative senior day coming up with Lewiston, El Churro, La Crescent, and Caledonia. This was started last year, and uh, the goal of the, the day is to build relationships with students from other districts, learn about different careers in southeastern Minnesota, make connections with area businesses. And then uh, uh, they have also added this year uh, Fillmore Central, Spring Grove, and Houston. So it's uh, growing as we speak. Um, we also have a number of high school students who are having their work displayed at the Lanesboro Art uh, Gallery, uh, the Jared uh, High School Art Show. And that's on display in Lanesboro there um, until February 2nd. Again, he reached out and is congratulating the ninth grade Knowledge Bowl team as well as to um, tell uh, Barnolds for placing first and Aubrey uh, Ingvaldson for placing second in the district spelling bee. And they will be representing uh, our school district at the regional competition in Rochester on February 11th. Um, coming up, uh, we have our annual uh, Fine Arts Night, which will be held on March 8th. It's a great celebration for arts, and it gives uh, our parents an opportunity to see their children involved in the arts and the fine art programs that we offer here at Rushford Peterson. Mr. Tim is attending the uh, Rushford City Council the, tonight, working on an ordinance to, uh, with the city here in regards to e-cigarettes and vaping and so he's reached out to the city uh, to pass an ordinance uh, that prohibits the use of uh, <clears throat> the e-cigarettes. So we'll wish him well and hope that goes uh, very well. On uh, February 4th, Neil Dennison from the Victim Services will be here and he will talk to our 5th uh, and 7th uh, through ninth grade students. Again, Neil has a great message for our students and uh, it uh, enlists conversation with our students um, and, and as far as addressing uh, the nature of date, dating and dating violence. A group of uh, our National Honor Society members travel to Channel One Food Bank on Monday, February, uh, or will be on February 18th to do some volunteering and to help stock shelves and unload trucks. And then on March 18th, we'll be showing as screen agers growing up in the digital age to our 4th through 12th grade students. And in addition, they'll be hosting a viewing party that evening for parents. Screen Agers is a documentary that dives into how technology is impacting our students and how to empower families to best navigate the digital world and to, to find balance. And then he went on to list some other things that are forthcoming here uh, during the month of February and March. Okay. Any questions for on the middle of high school report? Thanks. Mr. Bierdorf, activities director. Yeah, winter activities. Um, 
has got a lot of dates listed in, in my report, um, but I'll kind of just talk on a few things. One Act Play, as we've heard, um, is doing a fabulous job. Um, we hosted the east side of the conference here um, in our auditorium, which was great. Um, highlighted was the two top performers that day was Fillmore Central and Russia Peterson. Fillmore Central finished first in that, Russia Peterson was second. Um, we worked on the little, you know, little critiques up from that. Um, benefited from having two public performances in advance of the subsection, so I want to just thank uh, Mr. Musselman as well as his assistant Katie Humble for um, putting on performances for our students last Friday as well as for the public at 7 o'clock. Um, then went into the Caledonia and, and took first place. Now they advanced to go to Cass and Matterville um, this coming Saturday, so that's the, the section level there. Winter Dance Team is wrapping up. They have their last regular season um, on Friday at Southland, and then sections are the following week at Lake City. Uh, boys and girls basketball, we're kind of in scramble mode because we missed games yesterday. Um, as of now, or today, I'm sorry, as of now, it's not looking very positive for tomorrow because since we've had our meeting, Mabel, Lanesboro, Houston, Cal, Chatfield, Lewiston, and Fillmore have all closed. So, um, and Fillmore's one that we're playing, so our games are on for tomorrow. <laughs> We'll deal with that, um, but we'll get those games in. Uh, and then wrestling is also um, wrapping up the regular season. They've had a tournament at Casamadio last weekend. Uh, we've got Grand Meadow and La Crescent that we go to, and then we host our one and only home meet here on February 7th versus Dover Yoda. And then in team sections is the following week, which we may be hosting here at Rushford on the 14th, and then individual sections are the following week for that. Um, we've got other things on the calendar there. Uh, a couple things that weren't in there that I just want to point out. We have Cancer Awareness Nights, which um, we used to call them the Pink Out Nights. Uh, we, it, it's been handled by different groups. This is handled by our student council now, uh, with uh, Dina Matheson overseeing that as well. But the night's there. We're going to have um, special awareness as well as some different events going on for our home wrestling on February 7th, the girls basketball on February 12th, and the boys basketball on February 15th. We'll be recognizing our AAA winners and our Excel winners on February 4th. Um, and then we've got the Fine Arts Night, which I know was in Mr. Tim's report as well. The Fine Arts Night coming up on March 8th. That's where we showcase our band, our choir, our speech, our art, industrial tech, as well as even appetizers from our FCS group as well. So um, it's kind of a, a special event that we've got coming up on the calendar as well. One last thing I just want to acknowledge. Um, it's, I was in, a, in kind of a group email. Uh, we've got some of our schools in our conference are questioning how many schools still have pet band. Um, they're having a struggle to get enough um, nights to get the pet band to play or they can't get participation. And I just wanted to point out um, that I was proud to say that we're one of them that does have our pet band regularly playing um, under the direction of Mr. Adam George. Uh, we have them once a week for our fall as well as for all winter. Um, and that was rare. I think there's only one other school in our conference that does that. So. It's great that, that Mr. George is able to spearhead that. It's great to have them in the gym for them to showcase and share their talents publicly. Um, I think it's just a great thing, and I was kind of shocked to hear that, that we're one of the lone ones that are doing that now, and it's, it's great to hear them. So just wanted to throw that in my report as well. So. Welcome. Any questions, comments, concerns? Questions for Mr. Well, I just want to encourage everybody to go to the Fine Arts Night, March. You'd be thrilled to see what these kids can do. It's amazing. 7 p.m. Friday, March 8th. Yeah. So. All right. Thank you, Mr. Brewer. Yeah. Um, item 9, we have, uh, you can see there, the, uh, what we've got going here for uh, the next uh, month. We've got a pretty Heavy schedule, so um, we need to uh, keep all that in mind, work, work that out. Uh, anybody have anything else? Sure, I do. Okay. Just, a, just an FYI to use the board, as Dan has clearly indicated to you, we're the long hold out right now, and we won't be out on an island. I won't do that <laughs> to you as a board or to myself. But just so you understand, um, since I've been here in 12 years, what, what I've experienced is that our news media is not doing our school districts any favor. If you recall last Tuesday, they had everybody hyped up and we had a half an inch of snow. Yes. 
and I, I get it, you know, drag cell, and now they're spinning this, that this is the worst Armageddon of the state of Minnesota. I will refresh your memory. <coughs> One of the first years I came here in 2008, we were on our way to the cities. It was 35 below, and wind chill was 45 to 50 below. We had school, probably should not have had school, but we were, we did manage. And it, it's really uh, gotten to the point anymore where we as a district don't get to make that decision because everyone around you makes it for you. An example, Rochester closed today before noon for the next two days. So you have to be aware that we're not just closing for tomorrow. We're closing for Wednesday as well. And fortunately for us, in knock on wood, we have e-learning days. And so they will all be learning days. It's a, it's a means uh, to keep uh, kids active and thinking of school. But at the same time, I'm just sharing with you my frustration with any more of the spin that takes place with our weather is just beyond comprehension anymore. It's just like, could you just be quiet? This is Minnesota. It gets cold in Minnesota. And I, I'll dare say to you that the school district north of the cities, this, is, this isn't even a, it isn't even a blip on their radar. Are you kidding me? No. They, and, all right, so there's 200 miles difference. It's, it's all mindset, so I'm just, I'll stop right there. <laughs> Before I have to issue its retraction. <laughs> So it's on record, we will not be having school tomorrow or Wednesday, so you won't be the first to hear it. So. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Oh. Look for a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> no retraction statement. All in favor? I think I was